12 candidates just face off at the fourth Democratic debate, aired live on CNN. That was at Otterbein University outside Columbus, Ohio. Well, whether you watched it or not, you've come to the right place because we'll go over everything you need to know. Who were the winners and losers? What were the big moments? And what does it all mean for the race to the White House? I'm Libby Casey. Welcome to live coverage from the Washington Post newsroom. I'm joined here in our studio by national political reporters Cleve Woodson, Amy Wang, and Sean Sullivan. Thanks so much to all of you sure. for being here. We'll go to Ohio in just a little while to talk to some of our reporters there. But I want to hear from you three who've been updating our live blog throughout the night and following the debate as well as covering these candidates on the campaign trail. What were the big moments for you tonight? Cleve, let's start with you. Biggest takeaways. Sure. One of the things I was looking at specifically was how Elizabeth Warren handled all this expected attacks that she was going to get mm -hmm. as she's kind of risen up in, in the polls. You know, she took attacks from Buttigieg, really from, from all across the stage. And I thought she did a, a, a pretty adequate, pretty good job of, you know, both dealing with the attacks, but also kind of turning the message and turning the end of her response to those attacks back to her platform, her policy, what she's going to do. I was also kind of looking at what some of the candidates who are fighting for a spot on the November stage are doing, like Amy Klobuchar, who, you know, kind of went after Elizabeth Warren, or, you know, Andrew Yang, who, who also went after Elizabeth Warren, are doing to kind of convince voters that they should be in this race for longer. Mm. Amy, your headlines of the night. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Cleve. I think we were all looking to see how Elizabeth Warren handled these attacks. We sort of knew that it would be coming. Um, I, I thought uh, Amy Klobuchar did a surprisingly strong job of trying to go after Warren uh, specifically. And I think Tulsi Gabbard, to some extent, it seemed like she kept trying to jump in and mention Warren and ask her questions, um, but didn't quite land those attacks as well. And to me, the most surprising thing was how consistent Warren was in her message. Um, I've been following her on the campaign trail and the question of uh, taxes on the middle class, for example, on Medicare for all, that is a question she gets a lot. And despite being asked multiple times tonight, she, she kept sticking to, to her answer, which is that mm -hmm. costs are going to go down for the middle class, but she uh, avoided uh, um, the issue of taxes entirely. We'll talk more about that this evening because that was uh, something that got a lot of attention, a lot of focus, and people weren't necessarily able to pin Warren down in a way that 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 caught her. So we'll dig more into that. But I want to hear your takeaway, Sean. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Cleve and Amy said. Another thing that I was watching, and I think a lot of people were watching heading into tonight, was Senator Bernie Sanders. He had a heart attack two weeks ago. He's been off the campaign trail. He hasn't been doing campaign events. And I think a lot of people were wondering going into tonight, what is he going to look like? What is he going to sound like? Are there going to be any changes to his presentation and to his delivery? And we didn't really see that. We saw the same fiery Bernie Sanders that we have seen in past debates. He was very animated. He was very impassioned, particularly when we, he was talking about health care. He was also impassioned on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to send a signal right now that, hey, nothing's changed. I'm the same candidate that I was. I underwent a procedure, and I'm moving forward with my campaign. And he projected, uh, I think in his supporters' views, a lot of strength tonight at that debate. So one of the rounds of questions from the moderators was about candidates' health. And Bernie Sanders was one we were all watching to see how he would respond. He wanted to pivot the conversation to something else. Let's watch this exchange. Candidates and their health. Senator Sanders, well, I want to start with you. I want well, to start. We're, we're moving on, Senator. I'm, I'm healthy. sorry. I'm feeling great, but I would like to well, respond to that question. I want to start by saying. And Senator, uh, Senator Sanders is in favor of medical marijuana. I want to make sure that's clear as well. Thank you. Senator Sanders, <laughs> this debate does tonight. mark your <laughs> this debate. Okay, so the reason why they were talking about medical marijuana is because decriminalization of drugs and talking about the opioid crisis was a question just a moment earlier. And Sanders really wanted to jump in on that, and he was not going to let the moderators move on without without giving him some airspace. Something about that, not just in how he was like, I'm fine, I'm doing well, but he also had that smile on his face. And Sean, you've been covering him really closely. Uh, he, he, he'd also kind of was like embodying, like, I'm here, I'm cool, I'm comfortable. Yeah, he seemed loose, mm -hmm. uh, funny at times, uh, impassioned at other times. He seemed like he was happy to be there. And, you know, keep in mind that he's he's been rested the last couple of weeks. He's a candidate who, before he had a heart attack, was running on a pretty aggressive schedule. He was doing multiple events a day. Sometimes he would do events in more than one state. Uh, but now he's had the time to rest up to prepare for this debate. I think it showed uh, in his performance. And he did seem eager to jump in on the healthcare conversation, on the conversation about 
pharmaceuticals, um, and he had a lot to say. So I think his performance coming out of tonight will be one that uh, a lot of people are looking at and talking about perhaps tomorrow. Okay, you were breaking some news like right as we were about to go live, I and mean, you had your laptop, it's right next to you, but you had your laptop, <laughs> yeah. you were like typing away as we were miking you up. Uh, what was the news and why is it significant? Well, on Saturday, Bernie Sanders is gonna hold a rally uh, in Queens, New York. This is gonna be his first rally since he had the heart attack. That much we knew, uh, but we, what we reported tonight is that uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, who's a rising star in the party, has a big following uh, among liberal voters, uh, is going to appear with Sanders as his special guest. She's going to support him in this race. This is a really big moment uh, right now because there has been this sort of quiet competition between mm -hmm. Sanders and Warren for the support uh, of Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, uh, but she's going to go with Sanders, and so that's a big moment in this race because she has a lot of followers, a lot of people who look to her as sort of their North Star for who to support in this primary if you're undecided between Warren and Sanders. So, you know, at a time when Sanders has been sort of struggling in the polls, this is exactly the kind of thing that he's needed uh, to get back on track, and we'll see if it has any effect in the coming days. Amy, as a reporter who's been covering Elizabeth Warren closely, uh, is this a blow to her to, to miss out on this endorsement opportunity? Is you it a know, surprise at all? I, I mean, I don't know that it is especially a surprise. It, Ocasio-Cortez has, you know, made no secret that she's friendly with Bernie Sanders. They've um, been on the trail before together. They've had a relationship in, in, in endorsing similar candidates in the past. Right, mm -hmm. right. And to what I was saying before about Warren being so consistent on the trail is she's asked about Sanders all the time. She's asked about whether or not she needs to do more to distinguish herself from him. And she always maintains that they're friends. And uh, I mean, so far she has not not uh, try to attack him in, in any way. Cleve, you know, as you were watching Elizabeth Warren and looking for these slings and arrows that, sure. that were going mm -hmm. at her, you expected that to happen because, as you said earlier, she has been rising in the polls. And the debates prior to this, she's really come out pretty unscathed. Um, and, and in fact, she didn't always have a ton of airtime, right? I mean, I mean, she was kind of okay mm -hmm. with playing it cool flying a little bit, radar. flying under the radar. Mm -hmm. That's a great mm -hmm. way to put it. Um, tonight, she didn't have that opportunity. So let's talk about whether the messages stuck or, or didn't stick. So I want to play a clip from Amy Klobuchar, mm -hmm. someone who you mentioned, Amy, is, is getting some significant airtime tonight, um, to give a sense of how some of the other candidates were going after Warren. Let's watch this. Bernie's being honest here and saying how he's going to pay for this and that taxes are going to go up. And I'm sorry, Elizabeth, but you have not said that, and I think we owe it to the American people to tell them where we're going to send the invoice. I believe the best and boldest idea here is to not trash Obamacare, but to do exactly what Barack Obama wanted to do from the beginning, and that's have a public option that would bring down the cost of the premium and expand the number of people covered and take on the pharmaceutical companies. That is what we should be doing uh, instead of kicking 149 million people off their insurance in four years. And I'm tired of hearing, whenever I say these things, oh, it's Republican talking points. You are making Republican talking points right now in this room by coming out for a plan that's going to do that. And I appreciate Elizabeth's work, but again, um, the difference between a plan and a pipe dream is something that you can actually get done. All right, well, we will give Elizabeth Warren some airtime herself in a few moments, but first, let's just break that down a little bit. This is a question about Medicare for all and how it's going to be paid for. Uh, we can dig more into the specifics of the plan in a moment, but Cleve, I just want to get your sense of of what was at play here with candidates going after Warren and what do you think was successful in their attacks and and what wasn't successful? Sure, well there's there's kind of two things. One, for for Amy Klobuchar it's a means of getting her name out there, of getting, of, of putting herself out there as a viable, you know, in her words, pragmatic alternative to Elizabeth Warren. So the message is not just at Elizabeth Warren, it's also to voters out there that says, look, I'm, I'm you know, I'm viable, I'm somebody that you should you should look at. Um, one of the things that, that I think is, you know, voters are grappling with on the campaign trail as we're, as we're all out there, it's how aspirational you should be versus how pragmatic you should be. Every, every single voter that I talk to kind of has that question. And I think Amy Klobuchar specifically is saying, you know, Elizabeth Warren has some good, you know, good ideas that sound great, but, but can they be put into action? You also see other candidates like 
Joe Biden kind of saying the same thing, just not as directly attacking Elizabeth Warren. And Buttigieg is also trying to carve out that sure. that sort of middle ground space. But Amy, let's get to the heart and the substance of this criticism of Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Mayor Buttigieg has definitely in recent weeks tried to differentiate himself more and more as someone who um, is not for Medicare for all. He's for his alternative, which is to put out a public option, but to let public uh, private insurance companies remain. And he's really, uh, to the point where this morning he released an ad where he was calling out Warren and Sanders by name, um, has sort of sharpen those attacks, if you will, um, and, and really sort of said, look, I am, I'm carving out that, uh, well, they wouldn't say centrist, mm -hmm. but that more moderate lane, mm -hmm. and trying to position themselves pragmatic, as an alternative. Right? Pragmatic, pragmatic as words, a, right? Trying to position themselves as an alternative to former Vice President Joe Biden. And like Cleve said, there are a lot of candidates vying for that space. Mm -hmm. There's Klobuchar, Buttigieg, O'Rourke, uh, to some extent, uh, Castro, a little bit less, but yeah, so it's, it's a crowded, it's a crowded space within the already crowded mm -hmm. field and time is sort of running out um, in the primary. Let's explain this question of taxes and, and why everyone's sort of talking about and why the moderators kept asking Warren and it kept kind of pivoting back to her because the way these debates work is if another candidate en enlists your name or mentions you, you get a chance to like jump back in to, to give a rebuttal or get back into the conversation. So she kind of kept cycling back in during that part of the part of the night. Um, but but I didn't really hear a firm answer from her right on this question of taxes. Neither did Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> or so she, you know, or so she says, or Pete or Buttigieg. Buttigieg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So or Amy, Beto. can you explain to us a little bit more about what Warren is like trying to explain to the American public that, that is her premise, but what the concerns the others have? Sure. Um, what, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, what uh, she has never explicitly said, but what Sanders has said, and you know, they- He's owning it. Right, yeah. Yeah, is sure. that taxes on the middle class will go up, but in the grand scheme of things, your medical costs will go down if you're a, a middle, member of the middle class. Now, she has said that, tax, uh, that costs will go up for the wealthy and for corporations, but I think she's just extremely hesitant to even use the word taxes. And so whenever this question gets asked, she goes into a very standard answer about costs and about how she studied the reason why families go bankrupt and mm -hmm. uh, about how costs, costs, costs will go down for the middle class. And um, I think, like I said, in recent weeks, this has really frustrated some other candidates like Buttigieg, Klobuchar, even O'Rourke came out tonight against Warren, which I, I was personally not quite expecting, and, um, and Biden in the end and accused her of not being clear, of being vague, mm -hmm. evasive, all sorts of... Well, um, no one wants a campaign ad to come out, whether it's next week or in six months' time, where she says, yes, I'm going to raise taxes on the middle class, whereas Sanders right. isn't as afraid of that. I mean, she did say that I won't sign a bill that increased costs. Yes, and that was new um, to me tonight, saying her saying that she was not going to do anything um, to raise costs on the middle class, I thought was probably the furthest she's gone in addressing that question directly. All right, well, let's go back to Ohio and to the debate spin room. Our reporter colleague, Joyce Coe, is live there. Joyce, what stood out to you tonight? Well, Libby, one of the other big uh, moments during tonight was around the gun debate. Now, here in Ohio, uh, gun control is certainly an issue that's important to Ohioans, uh, especially after the shooting in Dayton back in August, which is just about an hour west of where we are. It's an issue that led to a pretty contentious exchange between former Congressman Beto O'Rourke, who had his own city experience a mass shooting around the same time, and South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Take a listen. To my fellow Americans, to those moms who demand action, to those students who march for our lives, who in fact came up with this extraordinary bold Thank peace plan that calls for mandatory buybacks, let's follow their inspiration and lead and not be limited by the polls and the consultants and the focus groups. Let's Mayor do what's Buttigieg, right while we have response? time to do what's right. Mayor Buttigieg. The problem isn't the polls, the problem is the policy. And I don't need lessons from you on courage, political or personal. Everyone on this stage is determined to get something done. Everyone on this stage recognizes, or at least I thought we did, that the problem is not other Democrats who don't agree with your particular idea of how to handle this. The problem is the National Rifle Association and their enablers in Congress, and we should be united in taking the fight to them. 
Now, this is an issue that's been central to both campaigns for O'Rourke. Uh, he has proposed a mandatory gun buyback program. However, tonight he wasn't able to specify exactly how he would implement that program, especially for those who don't want to give their guns back. He wasn't able to directly address that question. Um, and for Buttigieg, he's made gun control a uh, top issue in his administration leading South Bend. But under his leadership, uh, South Bend has seen an increase in gun violence far greater than the average of any American city that's a similar size to South Bend. I was talking to some voters today here, uh, students at Otterbein University who were in the audience today, and they said that gun control remains a top issue for them, uh, specifically going in on the urgency to find a solution and also extending the conversation a bit more to domestic violence and gang violence and how they want those issues addressed as well. Libby? Thanks so much, Joyce Coe, live in Ohio. Okay, these other candidates, did they get airtime tonight? I, I want to talk more about sort of the, uh, the folks that were literally in the center of the stage. And if you didn't watch the debate, if you're just catching up on everything now, the candidates that are polling the highest, right, they are in the center of the stage. So it fans out from there, and it's the folks on the edges that are trying to get some airtime and, and make a dent in things here. So who stood out to you? Because I'm going to put Beto O'Rourke in, in that camp. Who stood out to you guys as someone who um, was having a successful bid tonight and, and who was not able to break through, Cleve. Yeah, I, you know, I think Amy Klobuchar kind of, you know, she's not made the the November debate stage yet. I think she consistently kind of lofted successful attacks at um, Elizabeth Warren. In in the past, you know, Klobuchar has tried to really stress her policy and and, and the, the changes she's made on Capitol Hill and kind of get in these kind of one-liner zingers. And you know, in in this debate, she's kind of calling on Elizabeth Warren by name, by first name as she talks about, you know, these policies are these inconsistencies. Again, it's a message to Elizabeth Warren, but it's also like to voters, you know, I am here, I am an alternative. Amy? Yes, I think through all these debates, we've sort of seen this subplot of um, the candidates trying to make the case, and not only can they go up against each other, but they can go up against Trump. Sure. And I mean, Amy Klobuchar said multiple times, I want to say to Trump, if he were here, this is what I would say. I mean, she was really Explicit. laying out yeah. explicitly mm -hmm. that uh, hypothetical scenario. I mean, I think, um, I think Buttigieg did a good job uh, sort of maximizing his speaking time. You, you saw him a little more aggressive than he was in past debates, um, going after people, getting a little bit uh, more personal. Um, like in that exchange we just saw with Beto O'Rourke, and um, and yeah, I thought Warren again did a, did a good job standing against the attacks and sort of defining her positions. I want to hear from you, Sean, in a moment, but let's ping off of what Amy said and go to one of these exchanges where Warren was was you know getting some slings and arrows and, and was able to sort of deal with it and pivot. Beto O'Rourke is one of those people she mixed it up with. He specifically went after her approach to taxing the rich. And sometimes I think that Senator Warren is, is more focused on being punitive or, or pitting some part of the country against the other. Um, instead of lifting people up and making sure that this country comes together around those solutions. I'm really shocked at the notion that anyone thinks I'm punitive. Uh, look, I don't have a beef with billionaires. My problem is you made a fortune in America. You had a great idea. You got out there and worked for it. Good for you. But you built that fortune in America, I guarantee you built it in part using workers all of us help pay to educate. You built it in part getting your goods to market on roads and bridges all of us help pay for. You built it at least in part protected by police and firefighters all of us help pay the salaries for. And all I'm saying is you make it to the top, the top one-tenth of one percent, then pitch in two cents so every other kid in America has a chance to Senator, make it. Senator, thank you. That's Secretary what Castro. This is about. All right, Elizabeth Warren tonight. Amy, as a reporter who's been covering her on the trail, what are you seeing in that tape? Well, in that tape, um, I'm seeing, you know, the the off-the-cuff response is that she's surprised that he thinks she's punitive and she doesn't have a beef. But when she goes into that line about um, the roads and the workers that we all helped educate, that's a, that's a fairly standard line in all of her stump speeches. And she probably knows that it's one that reliably gets applause at her events. Um, after that, usually people, the crowd starts chanting, two cents, two cents. I mean, they're very familiar with her wealth tax. And so I think she used it to good effect tonight. Sean? 
Yeah, I think uh, d in terms of who sort of stood out on the candidates who were not in the center mm -hmm. stage, I agree with what Amy said about uh, Mayor Buttigieg. I mean, I think, you know, it was striking that at one point, former Vice President Biden had to re-enter the fray and say, by the way, the plan that he's talking about, that's my mm -hmm. plan. So mm -hmm. Buttigieg sort of owned that space of being the alternative to Medicare for all early in that debate. Uh, there are a few more candidates that I think were intriguing to Democrats coming into this. One of them was Tom Steyer because this was his first debate, first mm -hmm. chance to sort of make a splash. It wasn't clear that, that he really did that. Uh, and another candidate is Senator Kamala Harris who uh, made a big splash at an earlier debate this year where she took on former Vice President Biden. But it hasn't seemed like she's been able to sort of recapture that in any of the subsequent debates. She's sort of found different ways uh, to talk about her message, to talk about how she would take on Trump. Um, but we haven't really seen her break through the way that we did in that earlier debate. So it is tough when you are not one of those you know, central candidates in the middle of the stage to have your breakthrough moment because as we'll look at you know, after the fact, we'll, we'll see that these candidates didn't have a lot of time in total uh, to talk and you really have to maximize that time. Um, and some candidates did and, and, a, and a lot of these candidates didn't. So we might find a situation in a couple of weeks where you know, the candidates that were sort of on the bottom tiers of these national and state polls are stuck in those bottom tiers. And these debates are only going to get more competitive in terms of qualifying for them. You're going to need to meet higher polling thresholds, higher fundraising mm -hmm. thresholds. It's going to make it even harder for these candidates. And we're starting to sense that you know, they know this could be, uh, if not their last chance, one of their last chances to break through. Well, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah. I, I think that exchange also kind of illustrates a choice that voters are making. It's like, do you want someone who um, is conciliatory and talking about compromise and I'm going to you know walk walk across the aisle and, and work with other people or do you want somebody who's going to kind of stick it to those people that they believe are holding you know America down and and each candidate is trying to carve out you know where specifically they are on that continuum and trying to really highlight where their opponents are on that continuum uh, Dave Weigel, a national reporter covering politics, is in Ohio. He's in the debate spin room. I want to go to him now to hear his take on things since he is there. Dave, first of all, we've been talking uh, with our team here about their takeaways. What are you feeling there that we might be missing? Like what's new to you or what's specific about being there in Ohio tonight that we may not understand? Uh, you saw the same re reactions on TV. I mean, we're, we're in the, the room watching on TV screens. I guess you hear more of what reporters groan or uh, find to be exciting. But my takeaways were that people came in expecting Warren to face attacks. She did. I wasn't sure that anyone landed something memorable on her. Uh, especially if you're Amy Klobuchar or you're Pete Buttigieg, you kind of had to adopt a new personality, a new aggressive frame to go after her. The Warren campaign's approach to all that has been these candidates are mouthing what donors have been saying they want people to attack Warren on, and they they feel like they evaded that. They also were, just sticking with the Warren people first, they were, I think, pretty happy that some attacks they were prepared for, you know, Native American, foreign policy, defense, defense votes, didn't come up. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard tried it uh, before the buzzer to go after her as a commander in chief. Didn't didn't get through. So she, I don't know what the spin, what the spin is. The sense around here is that she had a, a good time. Beto O'Rourke, pretty disastrous. Uh, Kamala Harris, I think, had very good moments. Chased by a strange decision to go all in on banning Trump on Twitter. Uh, and I think the Beto campaign, the Gabbard campaign, came in with. Uh, kind of do or die expectations and did not perform that well. But in, in terms of Joe Biden, we've, this is the, I think the, the fourth debate, or third debate in a row, because he recovered in the second one, where he delivered what he came to deliver. He had a couple memorable responses about his record. But I did, I, I looking at what the mood was, felt that uh, he fell for some bait in arguing with Elizabeth Warren over who got credit for the CFPB. I'm not sure, sure that that's how he went into it, but the Warren, approach to this seemed to have been to bait Biden on one of his traits, which is a lot of pride in his very long record, obviously the longest, the most achievements in the field uh, as vice president, as a senator. He tends to get very proud and defensive about w the work he did. And there were moments where sometimes that didn't make sense. Once was in, in that exchange with Warren over CFPB, once was saying as a candidate that the Senate should do what this, what Mitch McConnell did to the Obama administration if there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court. 
that did not make a lot of sense. I mean, the, Demo the Republicans were able to block Merrick Garland because they had a majority, something that J Joe Biden was unable to crack. Democrats don't have a Senate majority. A couple of strange moments like that. So I thought, with the expectations coming in that Warren would be under pressure, basically she survived that pressure and other people made strange decisions in attacking her. You mentioned one strange decision uh, that Kamala Harris made about Trump and Twitter. I just want to explain that a little bit in case people weren't following really closely what was going on during the debate. But she invited Elizabeth Warren to join her in calling for Twitter to ban and shut down President Trump's uh, Twitter account. And, and Warren just didn't take the bait. She just kind of pivoted off of that uh, and, and kept things on big tech and, and companies. Um, but, but Harris like doubled down on it and kept going going at that. It was, it was sort of an interesting choice, Dave. Um, I, I want to ask you about the impeachment fight, because in your newsletter, The Trailer, where you, where you talk about campaigns, you had some questions going into tonight, and one of them was, would the impeachment fight change anything? So did it? Yeah. I think it actually changed things in every Democrat's favor. So the, the conventional wisdom, and I work for the Washington Post, we work, for, we work for the Washington Post, we're part of the conventional wisdom, has been that this crowds out the Democratic primary. To a large extent, it does. It's been harder for people who are not front runners to get attention. What it did in the debate, though, is create a good 15, 20 minutes in the, at the front where people were making points about Donald Trump's unfitness for the White House, something every Democrat agrees with who's voting in this primary. What they did about an hour later was a long round about Syria and about, about foreign policy. Again, they were all going after the president. Something you hear a lot from Democratic voters when I'm out there in Iowa, New Hampshire, 48 other states, is they're frustrated that Democrats have been debating the intricacies of their policies and they don't want them to just talk about Trump, but they've been annoyed that there's so much infighting and so little of an idea of how they'd run against Trump. And they got a very good idea of that ironically, because of impeachment and Syria, because of two things that have been vacuuming up some of the column inches and the TV time for these candidates. Okay, so I want to ask about Joe Biden and your take on how he performed tonight. What are your thoughts? I thought it reminded me a bit of the third debate where he, he did what he needed to do in a number of exchanges. Uh, I don't focus much on when he you know he says number three, I mean number, th number two, whatever. Um, but as in the third debate where people had already written their takes and then at the at the end after the buzzer he said something kind of silly in the third debate it was the record player monologue uh which then got parodied by saturday night live and this it was again the exchange about the cfpb with warren uh twitter's not everything but i saw what i saw a week ago when warren was getting questions over whether she exaggerated her uh experience as a teacher being let go while she was pregnant i saw just women who have various opinions about this race getting really irritated with Joe Biden you know, looming into her space and saying that I went on the floor and got the votes for you. She politely stared him, stared him back and gave Obama the credit for the CFEB. That's something that I think the Biden campaign should have expected, however they think that this played. Warren consistently, <laughs> in her books and in interviews, gives Barack Obama the credit for the CFPB, and the implication is that Joe Biden was not terribly useful in that fight. And so she had a chance to exploit that on stage that I think he fell into. I don't know how every Democrat is going to interpret that. I did see a lot of uh, women who saw themselves a little bit in the Warren response to that and in, in the way that she was being challenged to take back credit for a thing she did. All right, so Dave, where do you go from here? Uh, perhaps literally, where do you go from here? <laughs> but, but also, what are you going to be looking at over the next 24 hours as, as people sort of chomp over this debate and, and, and think it through and digest it? Well, I, I literally will go to uh, the, back to the home of the World Series contenders, Washington Nationals, in uh, nine, or, nine hours or so. Uh, where I go with these candidates, uh, look, I've been in this position after a number of debates where somebody seemed to have a great night, they made their points, I followed them, I wanted to see if, if things ricocheted, if they got a bounce. I did it with Julian Castro, I did it with, with Cory Booker. This debate's a little bit less clear, I'm interested where things shake out. Uh, so I, I'm <laughs> curious about how voters interpret the way Warren answered the very well expected questions about Medicare for All, whether there was any reward or any frustration with the new aggressiveness from people to judge from Amy Klobuchar. Um, the, the Bernie Sanders response I'm also I'm, I'm curious about, and I, I am in, interested to see what happens when Kamala Harris, when Beto O'Rourke, when Tulsi Gabbard, people who do not have great nights go back on the trail. Uh, Gabbard in particular doesn't seem to have a lot of growth potential because she's going after a very 
mi minimal number of Democrats, people who are, think that Hillary Clinton was too tough on Donald Trump in the 2016 campaign. So yeah, I'm, I'm less clear about where things are gonna move after this debate than I was after the previous ones, but in general, Elizabeth Warren has taken fire in each debate, more in, more in, each, in, in each debate one by one, I would be surprised a week from now if her support is not stable or if it's not increased a little bit. Finally, who's over your right shoulder? Because everybody's crowding around over there. Who are you? Who, who are they all looking at? Um, I can't tell. Amy Klobuchar, sort of, because she's talking to Chris Hayes. That's Kamala Harris, yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe I'm not trying to quiz you on the candidates, Dave. Yeah, okay. We, we know you know who all the candidates are. Um, Dave Weigel uh, writes the trailer, edits the trailer, a campaign newsletter. You can check that out. Thank you so much for joining us from Ohio and the Debate Spin Room. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're letting him go. Goodbye, Dave. Um, okay, so it's funny because Dave is everywhere. I mean, Dave Weigel's going to like every state and talking to everyone, and I always love hearing what he's watching and what he's going to be looking for over the next couple of days. Um, and he, of course, mentioned that the Nats have earned their first trip to the World Series. It's a headline on the Washington Post right now, which I'm sure you know about because you are a human being consuming the internet right now. But if you're a Washingtonian, this is a very big deal. Um, he also talked a lot about the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It's something that is very important to Warren's legacy. And, and what he was saying was significant, Amy, because um, she does talk about President Obama and, and his significant role in that. Um, can you just tell us briefly why the CFPB is so important to her? Well, uh, like she said in the debate, it, she went up against um, incredible odds to get this agency passed. Um, and she, it is incredibly important to her to the point where on her Twitter bio, she lists it as one of her children. Mm -hmm. I think it's like Amelia, Alex, CFPB, and then her dog Bailey. Mm -hmm. So, um, and like Dave said, uh, this idea that Biden sort of stepped in and and in very f a forceful tone said, I got you the votes, is almost implying that he, he should be given, you know, equal credit. Um, sh her response was one of the most, I thought, withering of the night. She sort of paused and spaced out her answer and said, you know, I'm deeply grateful to President Obama for the work he did and other people and didn't mention him by name once. A and that was that. Um, so it is, she, she does mention it occasionally on the trail, uh, you know, as evidence of what can be achieved if you quote unquote dream big and fight hard, which is another one of her central campaign mottos. And so I think, like Dave said, this was, this was a bit of a trap that Biden walked into tonight. Yeah, you know, as I've been talking to Dave about, about what he's hearing from voters, and I'm sure you all are hearing this because all three of you out are on the campaign trail, he says a lot of voters are telling him that what they want is a candidate who can go up against Donald Trump, that voters have confidence that, that a range of these candidates would, once they got into the White House, start dismantling what had happened um, under the President Trump administration, but they are trying to figure out who's going to be able to get to the White House. Um, Sean, as we watched her deal with that exchange from the former vice president, did it, did, is that the kind of thing voters are watching for to see, like, can she be on a debate stage in a few months' time against President Trump? Absolutely. I, I've talked to a lot of voters who, in their minds, have, since day one, been trying to picture each of these candidates on a debate stage with Trump on a day-to-day -day campaign with Trump. How are they going to respond to his tweets? How are they going to respond to his attacks, a lot of which are not based in fact, a lot of which are not uh, backed up by evidence? How are they going to deal with that? You know, you're seeing attacks from Trump and his allies at all times of day. So the rules by which Trump plays and campaigns are very, very different than what these Democrats are playing by in their race. So I think a lot of voters are sizing up these candidates. And that's a question that I think has surrounded Senator Warren as she has climbed up the polls in recent months is, how electable is she? How will she match up against President Trump? What kinds of contrast will she be able to draw? Um, and then you have somebody in Joe Biden that sort of the pillar of his candidacy is, I'm the one who can beat Trump. I'm the most electable candidate. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I think it is something that, that voters are watching. And what struck me uh, talking to them out in the campaign trail is the pessimism and the fear I hear from a lot of voters that you know they like these candidates, but they're afraid that somebody, uh, whoever the Democratic Party nominee nominates, uh, is not going to be up to that challenge because the challenge that Trump presents is so unique and he's such a difficult candidate to run against. So I think a lot of these voters are really worried about making sure that they choose the candidate that's best able to win. And when we see these debates happen, it's the perfect opportunity for them to say, you know. 
how would that person look like standing next to Donald Trump? How would that person sound like talking uh, with him in a debate? And so I think that's what makes these debates really, really critical, especially in this race where electability seems to be a foremost issue on the mind of voters. Cleve, we haven't been talking about Vice President Biden uh, nearly as much as we might have a couple of debates ago. Um, so what were your takeaways, as we heard from Dave, he gave us his analysis. What were your takeaways since you've been covering sure. Biden on the campaign trail? How did he do tonight? I'm always trying to listen to stuff that filters down, not to just to us who watch this stuff religiously and, and every inhalation, we're like, oh, what, what did this person mean? But to voters who, you know, including some who may have been like, oh, there's a debate on today. And, you know, I think one of the things that Biden has been stressing on the campaign trail that might resonate with those voters is, you know, that he, I guess in his words, can kind of fix what Trump has done from day one. You know, he, he, they all, you know, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden all got the age question. And Joe Biden said, what, I, what it gave me is wisdom. You know, it gives me the ability to step into the White House and begin to immediately do what Democrats want him to do. So I think that's one of the things that, that I think he was trying hard to, to hit home, both on the campaign trail and in this debate. Mm. I want to show you an exchange between moderator Anderson Cooper and former Vice President Biden. And, and this exchange focuses on President Trump's attacks on Biden and his son, Hunter. Let's watch this. Mr. Vice President, President Trump has falsely accused your son of doing something wrong while serving on a company board in Ukraine. I want to point out there's no evidence of wrongdoing by either one of you. Having said that, on Sunday, you announced that if you're president, no one in your family or associated with you will be involved in any foreign businesses. My question is, if it's not okay for a president's family to be involved in foreign businesses, why was it okay for your son when you were vice president? Vice President Biden? Look, uh, my son did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. I carried out the policy of the United States government in rooting out corruption in, in Ukraine. And that's what we should be focusing on. And what I wanted to make a point about, and my, my son's statement speaks for itself. He spoke about it today. But Mr. Vice President, yeah, as you said, your son Hunter today gave an interview, admitted that he made a mistake and showed poor judgment by serving on the, the, that board in Ukraine. Did you make a mistake by letting him? You were the point person Anderson, on Ukraine at, no. at the time. If you, you can answer. Look, my son's statement speaks for itself. I did my job. I never discussed a single thing with my son about anything having to do with Ukraine. No one has indicated I have. We've always kept everything separate. Even when my son was the attorney general of the state of Delaware, we never discussed anything. So there'd be no potential conflict. My son made a judgment. I'm proud of the judgment he made. I'm proud of what he had to say. And let's focus on this. The fact of the matter is that this is about Trump's corruption. That's what we should be focusing on. Okay, uh, clearly Biden knew this was going to be brought up sure. like really soon tonight by the moderators and or by his opponents. How did he come off tonight? And Because he had lots of time to prep for this, Cleve. Sure, and, and, and even practice. I mean, he had a press conference on Saturday or Sunday um, and, and plenty of time to prep for it. Um, I, you know, it's one of those things that exist on two levels. You know, on, on one level, I think he said and repeated the same thing, that he's done nothing wrong, that his son didn't do anything wrong, that, this, that the focus should be on Trump. But I think, you know, voters are also sort of looking, and, and this is the kind of undecided thing, are looking to see, um, as Sean brought up earlier, you know, how he deals with these attacks by Trump over and over again on Twitter or on TV or, you know, from, from a, a $10 million ad blitz and all of that stuff. He, he's trying to send a message that he didn't do anything wrong, but I think he also is trying to send home the message to voters subtly that, look, I can handle this. I, my family can kind of take this and, and kind of compete with Trump on his terms. What were your takeaways, Amy and Sean, about how Biden handled that line of questioning, Amy? Um, I would agree with Cleve. And what was striking to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that I, th I thought it was good for the other candidates that they let the moderator ask mm -hmm. that question. Sure. Um, like we weren't sure if maybe the other yeah. candidates would challenge him on that, but I think it probably would have been a bad look because some voters are very frustrated that it's brought up at all. You know, they, they, they say that there's, no, there's not been any wrongdoing, and by bringing it up, you're sort of playing into Trump's hands. Mm -hmm. It seems like he handled it about as well as he could have, but it still seems like a potential political problem to me. Because a lot of Democrats I talk to say, you know, for your average voter who's not paying attention yeah. to the mm -hmm. specifics of what is going on, what 
Trump and his allies are saying, uh, the fact that you know those attacks are not based in fact, they might look at the situation and say, you know, I've heard something. Uh, I don't know quite what it is. It's something strange about uh, Biden and about his son, and the fact that he has to keep answering that questions. I think more and more of his allies are starting to realize is a potential problem because he's not. It means he's not talking about health care. He's not talking about other things. He's trying to make this about a contrast with Trump. But the reality is he keeps having to answer questions about himself and his family. And when he's doing that, he's not talking about these other issues that he and his campaign want to talk about. So. Did you it know. feel like he was in the defensive with this? Because he has been trying to come out on the offense, talking about how, look, we're, we're going to do business differently when I'm in the White House. And let's look at how the Trump family is doing things. And, and we're going to, you know, we're going to tackle this nepotism thing when I'm in charge. I, don't, I didn't get the, as much of a feel of that tonight. I um, mean, I mean it, it feels like he's on the defensive whenever he's asked about this, mm -hmm. whether it be by, you know, us reporters and in a, in a gaggle or, or by anybody, in, in part because, you know, it involves him and his his son and you know accusations of of wrongdoing that that you know he feels strongly have been disproven and that have no no foundation so we always i you know i kind of concur with sean's point that that you know he just he he's sort of tired of answering that question but i don't know what that means that voters uh, you know voters are satisfied with the answer i want to mention the name andrew yang real quick just because it's someone <laughs> we have not even mentioned at all this evening why are you all chuckling <laughs> because I think it's revealing. It's very interesting because I hear so much on social media from people who are like, sure. cover this guy seriously. But then when he gets the chance to come on stage, he's got like his, his one focus that he's really looking at. Why haven't we talked about him yet, Amy? Yeah. And, and why do we all sort of like, oh, yeah, let's go back to that guy, right? Oh, yeah, we haven't talked about him yet. Well, I'm only chuckling because I, I know that the conversation online is going to be about how we didn't yes. sure. talk about yeah. him. Yes. I actually thought he had a, a good night. He tried to draw a distinction between mm -hmm. himself and Warren on a lot of different points, not just Medicare, or not Medicare, but on the wealth tax. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, for supporters of Andrew Yang, I doubt tonight would it would have knocked them off of the Yang Gang, out of the Yang Gang or whatnot. Yeah. Um, and he had, I think he had a memorable, a couple of memorable zingers, one of which was against Microsoft Bing. Um, but no, I, I thought he had a strong mm -hmm. night. And it's, if, I think he's in the next debate, or it's very likely that he'll be in the next debate. So we can expect to see more from Andrew Yang. Yeah, and early on in the debate, there was an extended conversation about impeachment, the impeachment inquiry. And I thought his answer was pretty notable, where he sort of pivoted to saying, hey, let's talk about why Donald Trump won. We're here in Ohio. Why did he win this state? Well, let's look at these manufacturing job losses. And then he talked about his plan. Um, and so he, he's, he's, he's different than a lot of these candidates. I mean, he's not somebody who is a traditional politician. And he has a big following. He's raising a lot of money. He's out raising and out polling, you know, sitting senators, yes. governors, yes. people who have been in office a long yeah. time. So I agree. I think he's definitely one to watch and somebody whose following is probably only getting bigger after each one of these debates. And, and he's fluid and comfortable on the debate stage at this point compared to Tom Steyer, who like could not break the camera's gaze. It's like he definitely felt sure. like someone who hadn't done this before um, because he, he didn't quite have that that ease and the ability to be on that stage in a way that felt familiar to him. Sure. Which, and you know, then, fair enough. You know, in earlier debates, it seemed like Yang was satisfied with kind of getting his idea out there, that the, the one idea, the 12 grand a year. Um, and, and, you know, now he, he's, you know, looking at Elizabeth Warren and saying, well, you know, you're, you're wrong on this wealth tax thing. These other countries have done it and, you know, we shouldn't follow their failure. So you do see somebody that's kind of coming into their own and getting more comfortable out there. All right. Well, we'll leave it there, and we'll keep uh, keep paying attention. I want to thank my colleagues so much uh, for all their insights. Uh, Cleve Woodson, Amy Wang, Sean Sullivan, thanks to all of you for being here with us tonight. And before we go, we have an exciting programming note. The Washington Post is hosting the next Democratic debate in partnership with MSNBC. You can see that there. We'll bring you the debate live from Georgia on November 20th. We'll be able to watch that on WashingtonPost.com. That gives you yet another reason to subscribe to our newspaper. You can also, of course, subscribe to us uh, on, uh, on YouTube. Just click the subscribe button there, and you'll get updates about our programming as well to get all sorts of information about programming during the election season. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you for watching. Good night.